Southwest preachers follow what's called a lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of readings. Uh, I often follow it, sometimes I don't. Uh, but each of those three years, there's a, a, a gospel assigned to it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we get John thrown in throughout all three cycles with uh, uh, Lent and Easter typically. This year is the year of Mark, and the more I preach and study <coughs> Mark, the more I really, really like Mark's gospel. Some would say it's the first gospel. I had a professor who would argue against that. Uh, but it's really compact, it, it's really intense, and... Um, I've really come to appreciate this beautiful little gospel. We're in Mark uh, chapter 1 this week, and this is what Mark tells us. Now John, after he was arrested, now after John was arrested, John the Baptist, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately Jesus called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him for the gospel of the Lord. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> I've told this story in another sermon about six years ago. I'm sure you remember. Uh, and I shared again this past week at Bible study, but as I thought about what it means to follow Jesus, honestly, I couldn't think of many better examples that I have witnessed in my own life than this. We had a fellow in the Marian church who quite literally showed up by accident one Sunday morning. His name was David. Our church hosted nearly all of the Alcoholics Anonymous groups in the community and David had been attending those groups uh, after having been released from a halfway house. David was also a Mexican national who had been living legally in the United States for something like 16 years. David apparently misunderstood someone to say that there was an AA meeting on Sunday morning at 9.30. And so he went to the usual room where AA meets at the church and was quite surprised when a Sunday school class started filtering into the room. Now, I'm not sure how long it took him to figure out this was not an AA group, but was a Sunday school class. He introduced himself and, and explained what happened uh, to the class. They just laughed it off and surrounded him with a lot of love and acceptance and quickly made David one of their own. He continued to come to the Sunday school class, made a lot of new friends, started attending worship as well. He eventually joined the church and became a very faithful, active member, which helped him a lot in getting his life back on track, following a very rough spell in his life. In fact, he met a young woman with whom he fell in love, and he proposed marriage to her during Sunday school that morning. He wanted his friends to share that. Well, my heart sank one afternoon when I received a desperate phone call from his fiancée telling me that the immigration authorities had picked David up that afternoon. David's past had caught up with him, and because of some prior convictions for domestic violence, which I actually think happened in Mount Vernon, uh, which were related to his alcoholism, immigration, who was going on a random run to pick up people, they hauled him in, put him in jail, and would quickly begin legal proceedings to have him return to Mexico. He was incarcerated down in Charleston, Missouri, and within a day or so, I drove down to visit him in jail, uh, put some money on his account so he could make phone calls, uh, delivered his Bible, which he had requested, as well as his engagement ring, which his fiance wanted me to take down to him. You know, I felt helpless, and I honestly thought I might never see or hear from David again. This was a new experience for me as a pastor. Well, an immigration attorney told us that the only way to slow down the legal process was to get him out of jail as soon as possible, which required, as I recall, something like over $10,000 for the bond. 
impossible. I mean, $10,000 ain't going to happen. David didn't have anything. Well, imagine my surprise when I received a phone call one Saturday morning from a woman in the church explaining to me that she and her husband felt God leading them to put up money for David's bond. Now understand, these were not people of great means or wealth in any way. They were, they are an ordinary, down-to-earth, working-class family. But they strongly felt that this was something that God wanted them to do. I promise you, they were worried less about risking a substantial amount of money and worried more about being faithful to what they felt God wanted them to do. So here's what they did. They used all the available credit on their credit cards, maxed out all of their credit cards. And for the remaining balance, they'd allowed a lien to be placed against their home in order for there to be sufficient funds to be applied to his bond. Thankfully, David was quickly released. He returned to his home and to his church. He was married shortly thereafter. And I don't understand the law, but somehow he successfully fought his extradition. It took several years to get through it. And I saw David just last Sunday evening when I returned to Marion for a funeral. His previous marriage didn't work out so well. She had a drug issue. He's married again, I think, to maybe a better, healthier woman. He's finally gotten his driver's license back, and he continues to work toward becoming a United States citizen. Every time I see him, he promised me, promises me it's going to happen very soon. Like I said to our Bible study group last week, who does that? Who does that? Who puts their own well-being in jeopardy on behalf of somebody you hardly know? Yeah, that woman called me just to kind of check it out and make sure he was legit. I mean, who risks their hard-earned assets to assist someone who's really responsible for his own mess? Well, I'll tell you who does that. It's people who know Jesus and who follow him. Folks who do what Jesus asks them to do. And although I share this story with you, that couple has never wanted anyone else to know their identity. I think folks close to it know who did it. But they want no accolades, they want no recognition, no congratulations from anyone, including David. They only wanted to do the right thing as they believed God leading them to do. Let me ask you, are you following Jesus? Are you following his direction in your life? Are you doing what he asked you to do? You know, we're hardly into the first chapter of Mark's gospel, and in the 14th verse, Jesus is announcing his mission. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Remember that repent literally means to change your mind, to change your way of thinking, to change direction. Repent and believe the good news of God's kingdom. And Jesus then begins his recruitment efforts. According to Mark, as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. A better translation might be, I'm going to make you fishers of people, fishers of men and women. I'm going to teach you how to catch people into the kingdom of God. How did the brothers Simon and Andrew respond? Mark says, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. This is one thing I love about Mark's gospel. There is a sense of urgency in it. The story moves at a rapid pace. In fact, Mark uses the word immediately something like more than 40 times throughout his very short gospel. So Jesus says to Simon and Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men and women. And what is their response? Immediately they left their nets and followed him. <clears throat> Immediately, without hesitation, without questions, without a job interview or a job description, without negotiating benefits or a salary package, without submitting a resume or high school transcripts, without a criminal background check, these very ordinary working class fishermen answered the call of Jesus and left their nets and followed him. 
the recruitment continues. Mark tells us, as Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately, he called them. Immediately, Jesus called them. And how did these brothers respond? They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, do you get how radical that verse is? They left their father in the boat <laughs> with the hired help and followed Jesus. One Bible commentary says this, the fact that these men drop both occupation and family obligations to follow the one who summons them demonstrates that their call comes from God. Such a break with family and occupation is extraordinary. In fact, their walking away from their father and the family business may well have put the welfare of the whole family at risk. I don't know about you, but I find that incredible. But perhaps even more incredible, even more remarkable, is this. Today, Jesus is calling you to follow him. Jesus walks up to you today, and he says, follow me. Follow me and I'll teach you how to catch people into God's kingdom. Do you hear Jesus calling you to follow him? Do you know that Jesus has a purpose in calling you and that purpose is to connect with human beings in such a way that they are brought into God's kingdom of love and light, God's kingdom of grace and mercy, God's kingdom in which all human beings are valued and loved. N.T. Wright, the English bishop and theologian, offers these thoughts. Sometimes Jesus' call comes slowly, starting like a faint murmur and growing until we can no longer ignore it. Sometimes he calls people as suddenly and dramatically as he calls Simon and Andrew, James and John. When that happens to you, by whatever means and at whatever pace, you will know. Jesus has a way of getting through and whatever we are engaged with, whatever nets we are mending or fish we are catching, somehow we will be sufficiently aware of his presence and call to know what it is we're being asked to do. Again, do you hear Jesus calling you to follow him? And if you do, how are you going to answer? Pope Francis has said, Following Jesus isn't easy, but it's wonderful, and it's always a risk. Will you follow Jesus? Will you follow him wherever he leads? Will you even risk yourself to follow him? Remember our app, our website, findhopedowntown.org through which you can give, uh, stay connected, or watch sermon videos that you might have missed.